June 14th, 1994, it's now called to order. The first item on the agenda is the introduction of a new chairperson, but there is no new chairperson. I am still the chairperson. Um, but I would like to um, welcome our three new members, um, Keith Witherell, Gail Bransfield, and Priscilla Armstrong. So we're happy to have them aboard. We'll try to make this not too onerous in the evening for your first, <laughs> for your first outing. Um, the next item is adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments? I have uh, one change uh, in, okay. in the... Uh... In the minutes come next. Oh, I'm sorry. But it's okay. Yes. Any adjustments? No? Okay. Moving on to approval of school board minutes and meeting of May 18th, 1994. Keith? Uh, yes, I have one change uh, in others present where uh, Keith Witherell should have been listed there as the president of the meeting. Okay. I also just had... Um, one typo on page 34A um, in the third bullet where it says Mrs. Gold, Goldman announced that Aaron Pond was the winner of the presidential scholar. scholar. Presidential is spelled wrong. No, that's fine. Okay. Any other changes? Okay, the minutes stand approved. Uh, the next item is comment by high school and middle school representatives, and I got a message at my house via my son that our high school representative will be late, but I believe we have our middle school representative. Good evening. Um, I'm Stacey Pickering. Nina wasn't able to come tonight. I think she was ill. Um, please excuse our absence from two uh, last month's meeting. Um, Nina and I were unaware of the canceled date, so we didn't show up. Um, two Fridays ago, the 7th and 8th grade had their final dance of this year. The student council in grades 7th and 8th would like to thank um, the PTA, also Mrs. Gramsci, Mrs. Putnam, Mrs. Herbert, and Mrs. Sadloff for doing a beautiful job of decorating. Uh, these individuals and everyone else who chipped in made the last dance something to remember. Thanks also to all the people that helped in the fifth and sixth grade social. Um, it was a huge success because we had um, the addition of karaoke and everybody seemed to like that. Um, with school coming to a close for the summer on the 17th, we had the following events planned. On the 14th, we will have field day um, where we will be doing different obstacle events according to the groups from the Boston Museum of Science trips that seventh grade took earlier this spring. Um, the 15th is step up day where a representative from the 8th grade will say a few words in honor of the 8th graders which will be leaving the middle school to go on to high school. And on the 16th we have beach day which is a favorite because the 4th and 5th grades will be spending the day at Crescent Beach. The 6th and 7th grade will be going to Scarborough Beach and the 8th grade will be going to Old Orchard Beach. And then the 17th, the following 17th will be the last day of school. Are there any questions? Well, thank you, and have a very good summer. You too. You too. Okay, the next item is communications. Twenty. I'm going to start by um, reading you the little notation here to the 1993-94 school board members. Actually, I think it is. We should really make that clear. That's 94-95. Thanks for your support of our students, the parents of the class of 1994, and Kerner for project graduation. Uh, something to look forward to. So I'm going to distribute the uh, pass these along as Charlie. There are some here. I guess their names are on them, and you're going to have to wait until next year to get yours. So I was thinking maybe I could uh, um, let's see, you change your seats. I don't know exactly where you are. So those will be yours next year. And thank you, <laughs> Roger Graduation and parents of the class of 1984. That's very nice. The mugs have, I presume it's the names of all the graduates on it. That's great. Very nice. Which actually gives me the opportunity to say that I thought graduation was outstanding this year. The weather certainly cooperated. Rick, you're a, a plum and handling all those stickers on your lapels was tremendous. The kids were great. It was it was a really nice event. Uh, yes, I agree with that too. Well, that's really very nice. Yeah, that's nice. Terrific. Oh, Thank you. Uh, also in communications, I did include in your packet um, a couple of things, some of which I think are self-explanatory. 
Uh, and I also, we have received some letters from parents. Uh, those people who have been on the board have received copies, and I'm, I think some of you are new to the board, received copies on our calendar issue discussion from last year, uh, last month. Um, but these are, these are sort of general interest also. Uh, Judy Liberty, a French teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School, and also the uh, chair of the department applied for and now has received notice that uh, she's been chosen to attend a special curriculum institute. Um, her interest was sparked because it is an institute that among other things um, is geared to helping changes in uh, middle school and uh, going into high school uh, types of programs such as ours. Um, the high school of course has been trying to figure out just what impact FLESS program brings. It, the kids really actually know more, their ear is better, so that the standing high school programs obviously need to be expanded and adjusted. So it's kind of a happy dilemma, but it is one that needs to uh, be addressed. And so Judy has uh, chosen to give some extra time this summer. We're proud that she has been chosen, and I'm sure it will be helpful. I also included a letter from Joyce Bell, because I know the board is very much involved with uh, computer um, issues. You've been supporting our efforts to not only develop a vision, but actually put some stuff in that works. Um, the story as outlined here is kind of neat because it shows you that uh, you don't just buy equipment and put it in, as I imagine Keith would tell us very well. That's for sure. And um, it, at times it did seem like a uh, continuing saga. But Joyce Bell, a librarian at the high school, has been extremely um, helpful in getting us uh, online in various databases in the years that she's been here. Teachers are working more and more with that possibility, students taking advantage of it. I also want to point out that another person mentioned here, Theo Van Dinter, a uh, senior who just graduated, uh, who has been one of our very effective computer hackers who we in fact have hired. He's uh, uh, excellent, we're going to miss him, we'll have to find a, a replacement from next year's juniors or seniors. Uh, and then I also included a uh, letter that was sent to me to simply representing the system, thanking uh, our students for participating in the 1994 Day of Caring sponsored by the United Way. I thought you might be interested in seeing some of the things the kids have been doing. Okay. Great. Okay, the next item is superintendent's report. Connie. Uh, the first item is the fourth grade assessments for this year. Um, you have had an opportunity by now, I'm sure, to look at your copy of the entire report. And Lyle has, uh, even though he had to do it a little hurriedly because we just received these uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, has in fact been able to put together his report and he is here tonight. Um, Lyle, do you want to address this for us? Uh, thank you, Dr. Coleman. The scores this year are very, very similar to the scores of last year. If you turn in to page two of the uh, state report, or page one of my report, you will notice that there are, uh, when the students were tested, there were 117 students in the fourth grade. All of the students took the test. All of the students are included in the report. Of the 117 who took the test, uh, 26 of our students have an identified handicapping condition. That's 22% for our school compared to 20, compared to 7% for the state. If you look at the scores, you will notice that reading is at 325, the same as last year. Writing went from 325 to 300. In math. We have this very same score at 355. Science was the, same, was the same at 315. Social studies was not tested last year, but the year before that it was 300. This year it's 300. In the area of humanities, last year it was 330. This year it's 325. And this year there's a new subtest in the area of health. And our students scored at 295. One of the things that I have done for you on page two of my report is to break out the scores of the students with a handicapping <clears throat> condition. And you can see that our students score very well. As a matter of fact, for math on the group of 
students who have a handicapping condition in our school score approximately at the state average and uh, are close to that in reading and writing. To the far right of that column, I've listed the uh, difference between the handicapped scores of our students, or the, the scores of our handicapped students and the average for the state. Going on to the next chart, you will notice that I have given you a, it says seven years history, it's actually an eight year history, comparing the uh, handicap scores with the students without a handicapping condition. And in the last chart at the bottom of page two, um, you will note that I have compared the boys' scores to the girls' scores and listed any gender difference. And the largest gender difference this year is in writing, where the girls score 51 points better than the boys. And that is just barely, that just barely reaches the level of significance. And that is way down. As a matter of fact, the whole gender difference issue is dramatically improved over the past few years where we've had gender difference scores of up to 100, 110 or 115 points difference. Those kinds of differences do not exist this year. And uh, the uh, scores are very even, both at the state level and at Cape Elizabeth. That's a real rapid uh, review of the testing, and I'd be happy to address any questions you folks may have. Charlie? On your report, page two, the second set of graphs on the 93-94 writing non-handicapped, I think it should be 323 instead of 223. Yes, you're correct. Thank you. It, it caught my eye because it's about equal to what the handicap was. Yes. <laughs> and, and so when I looked up at your previous score where you had broken it out, it said 323. So. We lost just 100 points in the transfer. <laughs> I mean, writing's been an issue, and I didn't want to make it look like it was a dramatic issue. One of the things I should point out, too, considering you mentioned that, um, last time I presented, we talked a little bit about scaled scores and how scaled scores, a change in scaled scores at the top do not move you very far on a percentile basis. That change of a scale score from 325 to 300 represents approximately a change from the 95th percentile to about the 92nd percentile. So you're looking at a change of about three percentile points. And that's why I say it's only halfway <coughs> to being statistically significant because of the small amount of change. Charlie? It's interesting after five years of looking at these, you learn something new every year or you observe something different. Uh, on, the st on the state's page eight writing results, one of the things I didn't realize, hadn't realized in the past was under summary of, annot of annotations, um, I had never noticed the commendations and needs and the percentages. Are we about where we, are, have we shown improvement or are we from past, his, from past years, or? I think we're about where we have been. As Connie said, we received these just last week, and these are very busy times at school, so I haven't taken a lot of time to review these in, in that kind of detail. It's interesting, it's one area that I had never noticed, that the, the evaluators commend or note students that need improvement. And you would, I, I would assume that the other 15% must be in, must have done all right without, have met the average or median expectations. That's what I was, I, I just wanted to know what the breakdown in pre previous years. I can go back and pull my reports, but it probably is easier for you since you have them all filed I together. I think that it's <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I do. If you can't we find We talked about filing systems last night and how, how one copes with uh, the reams of, uh, of reports and papers over the years. And uh, if you have I have them by years, but not broken down by uh, Actual categories. 
But I, it would be, I, that's one area it's, which show, would be of interest to me to know how we have fared as far as commendation needs over the years in writing. I can check that out and give you a call if you'd like. Okay, thank you. Um, I, just, I just have a comment. While, while these scores are certainly better than um, the state average, um, I'm just wondering why we can't seem to get them, get them a little higher at the fourth grade level. And we do see an improvement between, you know, from fourth grade to eighth grade, but is there any explanation for that improvement? Or should we be concerned about these scores? I, it just seems to me where we do so much better on, on the MEAs in eighth grade and then in 11th grade, they're you know, 400 across the board many times. Why are these scores so significantly lower? Do we know? Well, as I, as I say, I, I don't want to get into speculating why that trend has been there for quite, a, quite some time. At the same time, I'd like to reiterate what I keep saying, and that is that the significant difference, remember, is like a difference between the 93rd and 98th and 99th percentile. Uh, however, even though it is fairly small, it is very constant. It is, it is very constant, and I just wonder if there's some information in here that we should be using, um, and maybe we could be using <coughs> the language arts um, committee, but I mean, I think people seem to, at least in my experience, think that this is a fairly good test, better than you know, your average standardized test in, in terms of you know, the way the writing is, is um, scored and that kind of thing. And, you know, I hope maybe we can use that to see, see what we can improve. Charlie? One of the things that I did notice in looking at the state report is that for our band of, 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 of scoring, we're right smack in the middle almost on every category. And, and that band is determined by what factors, what determines our back factor of... Um, First of all, I do not put much stock in that band at all. But to answer your question. I mean, the state has some criteria well, for setting yeah, up. Their districts list have different bands depending on social, economic factors, all these other things. And all those factors are right there that gives you a formula for how they arrive at that. And it's the number of hot lunch, um, the number of free and hot lunch, hot lunch, uh, Free, uh, the number of free and reduced hot lunch numbers is one factor. Another factor is the level of education. And the other one was, I think, it's what occupa occupation level or something. It's Community occupation. Community yeah. And, oh, yes, home resources. And I'd like to point out, too, that that home resources comes from a student questionnaire where they ask such questions as, do you have a computer in the home? Do you have different kinds of things in the home? And uh, the community occupation is something that the principals fill out. And uh, those things are, I would like to be able to put more confidence in those because when you compare where we stand to where we should stand, we come out very good. So I'd like to be able to put more confidence in it because you can really say that's great, we're doing real well. But quite <clears> frankly, <throat> I'm not sure that's a real meaningful. Well, when you look at the state, look at. When, it's, when it's published in the state report, in, you know, in the Sunday, main Sunday telegram, I mean, each school district seems to have a different, a different band of acceptability. And uh, it's, it's, it's to try to find systems that are of equal social economic with all these other factors and there aren't too many out there that are in the same banding area that we are and even in those there is some fluctuation well i don't want to put too much stock in a test you know one test is just a snapshot in time and you can argue about its validity and and everything i, I just think when you have consistent scores over a period of time that stay so constant um, that we should just be seeing if, <clears throat> I've said this, I think every time these are presented, that we should be using the information that is valuable in here um, to advance our, our um, program. So, 
Just one more question. Is the fourth grade actually the first grade that actually gets tested in, in multiple areas? Are you talking about on the MEA? Or yeah. Yes. Is it is it really their big first formal kind of testing? No. No. For the for the state, it's the first. Yeah, I know for the state. I mean, but within our own system. In our system, uh, grades two and three have been tested before. for all these curriculum areas. For a similar, okay, similar array of subtests, yes. They, they 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 don't match one for one. No. But, but the standardized testing program that started this year in grade two and has always been in grade three is very similar to these in many areas, with the exception of writing, because the, uh, most of the, the standardized tests do not uh, ask for a writing sample. And, the, and the, one of the real strengths of the main assessment testing is the fact that it is a real piece of writing instead of a fill-in-the-blank kind of uh, test. So it should give you a better measurement of writing ability. Any other questions? Thanks, Lai. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lai. Um, the next item is really just a, a quick update. I didn't put anything in your packet because the transition committee is very much that going on. For, again, for new board members or anybody who may not be familiar with that term, uh, that again is a group of people, both staff, um, teaching staff, administrators, and uh, people working directly with the move. Uh, there's an enormous amount of packing that has to go on right now because we have to empty both the middle school and the Pine Coast School for the asbestos abatement program. And if you have been in either of those buildings recently, you are aware that there's a lot of um, material already in boxes. Each of these has to be labeled. Each of them has to be put somewhere. Uh, it's just an enormous project. We have had, um, I certainly want to compliment the spirit of the teachers who have been involved in all of this, as well as our um, uh, really a wide group of people. Um, we will be sending out material during the summer um, so that we have some means of communicating. Uh, the courier towards the end of the summer, will, we will be asking them to help us also print some material. Um, again, I just remind people, we know that you'll be curious, you'll want to have information about just exactly what's being set up between the schools, what are the safety measures, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, frankly, I think we will come out of this very nicely, but it is an awful lot of work, and I just want to make sure people get credit for it. Um, and I also want to thank parents who've been in. I know that a number of parents have volunteered to come in and help box things up. Uh, it truly is appreciated. I know teachers are very appreciative of that help. So it's a big area. We have building principals here who are involved with this. If anybody has any specific questions, we'll try to answer them. So Weatherby, who's very much involved with this, is also here. Charlie. Are we going to be hiring high school students to help this year like we have in the past? In, for a limited period of time during the move, we are doing that. Um, of course, the actual part of what they've done for us in the past is cleaning. Mm. And frankly, the major cleaning, of course, at the high school will still go on, uh, as well as some projects that are going on down there. Um, there's going to be a period of, of the summer when none of us are really going to be able to be in the buildings, and cleaning is going to be more in the sense of putting things back together as best we can. Um, so they'll be limited uses of high school students. But we'd be using them for the moving? Yeah. Okay. We are actually a combination of high school students, uh, our own in-house staff, of course, and we are also uh, using professional moving services for some pieces of things. But we didn't have to move our kitchen equipment. And it's, when they say move everything, they mean move everything, from the pencil sharpener to the stove. Yeah. At the middle school meeting this morning, um, Nancy Hutton suggested that if there were any parents that would like to help teachers pack or label, that they could call the uh, middle school office this week and leave their name, and then teachers who would like some help could um, use that resource on Monday the 20th. Mm -hmm. Terrific. That be appreciated. Question? No. Okay. Um, the next item, again, is just an information item. I put some information in your packet, but not anything separate. Um, 
the community approach to substance abuse has recently added a uh, dimension of trying to pull together those organizations, specifically police enforcement. Uh, we'll be reaching out to uh, our religious communities, various community groups, um, and we're just really trying to deal with it at the policy level at this point. So I am requesting that the school board's involvement also focus on policy, not only bringing together the policies we have in place or any that we might need to upgrade or look at, but make sure that we are aware of any policies that um, other community agencies are using so that we can have some consistency here. You'll be hearing more about this as we go along. I did mention it last night when we were talking about committee assignments and policies, um, and I, I realized that some of you are going to be working on this specifically. With, actually, we have a meeting tomorrow. Um, at the moment, we don't have a, uh, an actual policy uh, yet to present to the board, but uh, I do think it's important to take the draft policies that this group is looking at and present them to the policy subcommittee and to involve the board directly through that mechanism. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. And finally, um, we, we have in our pack, this is sort of a little bit of deja vu, but these things do happen. Um, Nancy Hutton and Bev Bisbee at the middle school uh, showed, a, I think, a great deal of energy and enthusiasm and did, in fact, submit a technology grant to the state uh, unfortunately, by this time we already know that we were not um, awarded that grant, but you still have to take a vote approving it. Uh, the reason for that is that had we had the best of all possible timelines, it would have been in the board packet for May because it did require board vote of approval. What we did at the time was to take a telephone poll, but any, it's a, something I almost never do because it, um, we have sunshine laws for board decisions and they need to be taken in open meetings and so on. But at any rate, um, in this case, I knew that people would be in favor of trying to get some money for technology. Uh, but whenever we take a telephone poll at the next board meeting, we must take a vote. So in your packet, there is a copy of the grant. Um, it's it's a, a, a very I think innovative and uh, important attempt. The fact that it wasn't funded simply means that we now have to think through and try to follow up in, in more imaginative ways perhaps for how we do that. Or I would also point out that the effort that went into that can be used in writing other grants. There are other avenues uh, by which we can try to get some money for those kinds of things. So a vote would be in order um, just to tidy up our process here. I'd entertain a motion. I move that we uh, accept the recommendation from the superintendent for an innovative edu education grant for special technology grants program. Is there a second? Second. Beth, any discussion? Charlie? I just have one comment. Um, I don't think it's a lost exercise because what we have to look forward to in our new buildings as far as computer technology, I think this, this makes an attempt at at looking at some of the some of the issues that we need to do, so I, th I think it it has it will serve a useful purpose. So it's not lost. Nancy, please. First, I also want to add Andrew Lomack McNear's name to that group that worked on the grant. Andrew was one of our co-developers as well. We don't look at this as a lost cause. We really are hoping to get some feedback from the state about the weaknesses of our grant so that we can use it to apply to Apple in the fall. They have a big grant program, and the applications open up in the fall. So we're looking forward to that. That's good. OK, all in favor? 7-0. Thank you. <clears throat> OK. okay moving on to school board subcommittees and re reports. First is finance subcommittee, and I'll turn it over to the new finance committee chair, Charlie <coughs> Rear. Thank you. We met at 6.30 um, this evening. Um, we reviewed the school lunch, uh, the state report, um, possible staff reductions for the next fiscal year, and discussed summer meetings that will be taking place uh, amongst the managers of the different uh, cafeterias. Uh, we looked at the dental insurance rates for 94.95. Um, now that we have um, an idea of what they're coming in at, 
Um, we looked at language for uh, um, a board vote later on, which has to do with an energy grant. Um, we looked at some salary increases for central office. Um, we awarded a bus garage bid to, to dispose of the current bus garage, which will save the system a considerable amount of money and dem demolition. Um, we only had one, one bid and we took it, which means they have to dispose of it. So that's a big savings. Um, we looked at, we did some discussion on bus driver custodial health insurance for 94, 95, and we discussed about property disposable during the construction period. And we also authorized the business manager to put our pickup truck out to bid. It's composed of a 76, 78, and 79 component. <laughs> we have replaced it with a one-year-old uh, pickup truck. And that's the extent of our report. Okay. And since I think all board members were present, there probably aren't any questions at this point. The next is school building committee. I need to do. Yes, we, we haven't had a meeting since our last um, board meeting. However, I put this on the agenda to remind everybody that it is the school board who will be voting to award the contract when the bids are open on June 30th. And in fact, later in the agenda under school board committee assignments, I will review our summer schedule that does include that school board, excuse me, school building committee meeting. Um, this is, of course, an exciting but anxious time for us. We're getting down to the wire, the, all the um, um, specs, prints, et cetera, et cetera, out in the hands of the contractors. Um, and that moment of truth comes and you open up those bids and you find out just where you're at. In case people are wondering um, what that means, we have a list of ad alternates, which is one way of controlling costs. That is, if the bids come in high, you start lopping off pieces of ad alternates. If the bids come in low, we're able to do some of those ad alternates depending on how low they are. Um, it certainly has been a long and um, in some cases tedious process, but at the same time it's exciting. And uh, there's one more permitting hurdle. We still have not had final sign off on the DEP. And um, I mean, it would, to talk about being anticlimactic, I don't want to face the staff it's been packing up. If the DEP suddenly tells us that we can't do what we have projected to do, I suppose it's possible. I'm being told by all the people who are dealing with this process that it's highly unlikely that they've given us indications that things should go all right, but one never knows. So, Do, do we know when we're going to hear? About that? Is there a it's date? supposed to be concurrent, almost concurrent with the opening of the bids. That is by July 1, but um, uh, just, just like to be realistic. I didn't want to ruin your evening, but uh, it is high. I mean, the architects are assuring me that things look very good. This should not be a problem, but it's always interesting uh, how these things sometimes go. Charlie. As the building committee, we have been aware that the DEP approval would be right at the same moment we would yep. be opening bids. So. We should point out that our timeline has been very tight for a project of this complexity. I mean, um, the fact that it is local money means that we have been able to move faster. Had this been a state-funded project, we'd still be on the planning board because there are so few windows of opportunity. Uh, we still had to go through all the same uh, state level approvals, but we were able to do it at a faster timeline instead of the once a year kind of thing that, that occurs. Um, so. Any questions, comments? Okay, moving on to unfinished business. The first is calendar for 1994-95 school year. Yeah, I did include in your packet a memorandum. Um, I think perhaps just to um, cover the issue, since I know this is an issue that people are had a great deal of interest in, I think it might be useful if I just read the memorandum for any public purpose. Yep. Uh, two members of the school board uh, regarding revisions to the 1994 calendar is voted on at the May board meeting. 
Um, most of our administrative discussions about the 1994-95 calendar have revolved around the impact that our building project will have on our ability to start and finish the regular school year. Our calendar generally follows the pattern of most school districts in the area. For instance, this year we started school before Labor Day, partly in order to accommodate the increasing impact of winter storm days that the past few winters have brought us, and partly to offset the late start that would otherwise have occurred given the sep September 7th date of Labor Day. All the area schools that I'm aware of anyway started before Labor Day this year also. This pattern continues with area calendars for 1994-95 and it would certainly have been our first choice. However, the asbestos removal program that must be accomplished this summer was originally scheduled not to be finished before September 1st. It seemed unlikely that we could get classrooms set up to allow us to plan on starting school on that date. We were also concerned about the impact of our calendar on the June 1995 end. As the architects have told us, we should finish as soon as possible in order to allow the extensive work planned for next summer to proceed. Our thought was to bring faculty in earlier for two work days so that those teachers involved in the asbestos removal, frankly most of our staff, could get ready. I am happy to report that the asbestos contractor has recently opened his subcontractor bids and has been able to readjust his timeline so that we can have more lead time to prepare for the start of school. He will finish by August 26, a week before the date previously set. Uh, I also want to point out I have worked with this particular contractor several times before and I am confident that he will do as he says, barring extreme circumstances. Therefore, I recommend that you revise the calendar as previously set and as presented um, on the calendar accompanying this memo. Uh, this calendar now starts school with two teacher workshop days slated for August 30th and 31st with students starting on Thursday, September 1st and Friday, September 2nd. This revision helps us get out of the buildings in a timely way next June. I regret the confusion that the construction project has caused in these discussions and that the impact of trying to avoid starting school in Rosh Hashanah has been complicated by it. I am also aware that parents as well as teachers will be confused and possibly distressed by the changes that we are recommending and that they may have made other plans. I can only point to the importance of trying to be as flexible as possible while we go through our construction project. There will be other complications and changes as circumstances warrant. We hope that everybody involved will try to keep their attention focused on how important these renovations are and that we will continue to try to keep you informed. I might add that um, when I was able to make this recommendation, I looked at the dates of August 30th and 31st, which technically fall within this year's teacher contract and did go to the executive board of the Teachers Association to explain why I think uh, for a variety of reasons I thought it was important and I do have their um, acceptance of that fact. So I think we have, we have no hurdle left. Charlie? <clears throat> As a result of our May meeting, uh, I think we still have one hurdle left and I think we have to do something about December 23rd and I, I would strongly recommend that we amend this schedule as presented by the superintendent to make December 23rd a school day and make the last day of school June 15th. June 15th, including snow days. Yes, yes. including the snow days. The last school theoretically then. Would be the 8th. The 8th. Okay. Very good. That was, I want to point out, the calendar I originally presented had that as a day of school. Right. Anybody have anything to say on this or I'd entertain a motion if I so move that we accept the Wait. recommendation of the yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Me. Yes. Oh sure, come on up. <clears throat> My name is Gail Atkins and I can't tell you how happy many people are that this accommodation has been able to be made. Um, and I do thank Superintendent Goldman for working on this and for all the bo uh, board members for being cooperative. Um, we are though, there are many people that I think still are a little concerned over the possibility of delays with the contractor. Um, that is not uncommon. And a couple of things that I would like to point out. I had called all of the local school districts and they were all starting before Labor Day with the exception of the town of Cumberland and their reasons for starting on September 8th 
um, which was the day that many of us were, were requesting, were that they were also involved with construction and that they were honoring the two-day holiday of Rosh Hashanah. So there was a school district that was, was making that exception. I also spoke with the director of the Portland Regional Vocational Technical Institute because I know there were some concerns about students who participate in that program and that if we started later, they might be compromised. And the director informed me that they, the way the program is set up, uh, the programs have alternate start and stop dates so that they can accommodate all of the school systems and accommodate whenever students can come and when they can end. He said it's also not uncommon for students to attend classes there early, even if their school system hasn't started yet, just so they can get to know the teachers and get, get a jump on things. So there is an, an alternative there for those students involved in that program. Um, in a very, very short period of time, I was able to obtain um, 142 signatures representing approximately 163 students. Um, I would like to submit these um, to the board. And uh, I stopped the petitions um, when I learned that, that there was going to be this um, compromise with the contractor. And I have no doubt that if I had attended the other meetings that I had planned to attend, such as the, the high school play and the Pond Cove Social, et cetera, that I would have had many, many more signatures. There was overwhelming support for starting school on September 8th and making December 23rd a school date. We had very, very, very few people um, turn us down. And I just hope that if for some reason there is a delay with the contractor this summer, if they uncover something in the schools that they had not planned to uncover that, and the board goes to vote on a new start calendar, um, that this issue could be looked at very carefully. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. I entertain a motion. Charlie? I move that we accept the recommendation of the superintendent to start school on September 30th. No. And no. Actually, the first. August. Did you say September? I mean, I'm sorry. I'm looking at <laughs> September. <laughs> on the, <laughs> I apologize. That would be a good I'm looking at September <laughs> right. with two August dates on it. Okay, August 30th, eliminating December 23rd as a day off, making that a school day and ending school on uh, June 8th, with the 15th being the last day for a snow day. Is there a second? So, any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. OK, the next item is second reading of a policy assignment of students to classes five-year-olds. Do you want me to read it? Frankly, we. Oh. I'm sorry. No, Beth asked if she should read it. I don't think she need. Does she need to read mm -hmm. it on a second no. reading? No, we went through it. I think before. As yeah. I recall, I don't yeah. remember. Yeah, we we did, did go through it. I, maybe um, new board members have questioned. This is something we're required to adopt oh. by statute. Yeah. Ed, entertain a motion. I. Have I move that we accept file JECDA assignment of students to classes five year olds. Second. Yeah. Any discussion? Second. Gail. Gail. Any discussion? All in favor? 7 0. Okay, the next item is motion to incorporate required wording for Sebago Energy Lease, and I will. Uh, Leave this to uh, our finance chair. How would you like to handle this? This is something that we, I believe, approved in April. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> but our legal counsel says that we need to amend it with appropriate language. Um, so I am going to um, move <clears throat> that we accept the new language as proposed by legal counsel. Second. Second, Beth. <laughs> Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Nope, Beth or Beth seconded already. Okay. Um, all in favor? 
1970. Okay, next item is new business, system-wide support <coughs> services scheduler. Bonnie? Um, I included in your packet a memo to two, as well as a projected budget and a job description, uh, as well as how we posted this position in-house. Um, this is a position that I originally had in the budget cut out during our need to shrink budgets uh, as we went through with state cuts and so forth. Um, but at the time, I knew that I would be making every effort to try to, to see what pieces would survive that we could go back and do it. Um, as a memo I included here points out, and for those of you who haven't, who are new to the board, we've done a lot of reorganization in our maintenance, custodial, transportation um, services. And I think that I can't give enough credit to the people who've been involved, primarily Sue Weatherby, who is frankly our, the director of our, our um, community services, but also has taken on from time to time a variety of system-wide um, responsibilities to, in fact, uh, we've done some total quality training together and she does, in fact, we, we try to emphasize that by calling her a system, systems coordinator. Um, this particular position also suggested itself to us when we visited USM maintenance facilities um, in an effort to get ideas about how we could better organize ourselves. We have tried, I think, every possible way to use work job orders of for either short-term, quick things, emergency issues, uh, classroom repairs, and, um, and major maintenance. And I, I, I think we were out of ideas as to how to make those more efficient. What we realized when we visited that facility was that um, communication is greatly enhanced by having a sort of dispatch position, somebody who is at a telephone who is very knowledgeable about people available to do on the spot issues, you know, emergencies, as well as ways to route work to the right pe people. Um, we've tried beepers, we've tried portable phones, we've tried um, uh, various kinds of computerized messages, and uh, frankly, we are convinced that this is a, a step we must take. Uh, however, I really got uh, get uh, crystallized in this particular decision when uh, at our planning board meeting, we had a condition put on our plans, and those of you who are there or following this know that that was the case, which insists on communication of a very serious order. Um, if there is to be any blasting while children are in the schools, we are to be given a 48-hour notice. Uh, then I, in turn, or my office, in turn, must give all parents involved a 24-hour notice, and, and that's pretty heavy responsibility. It requires a lot of good communication. Um, in addition, the planning board naturally, uh, as they would be expected to, talked a lot about concerns for safety, it's tight campus, how are we going to cordon things off, how are we going to be sure kids are out of there, and so forth. Um, that suggested to me, again, we need to redefine the responsibilities of people we have um, involved. We did. Uh, in fact, assigned Phil Jewett as a full-time administrator to make sure we had additional help at the middle school. Uh, but I was also told by the clerk of the works of the project that he wants to be communicating to one person directly that he can rely on to be sure that those messages that need to be communicated are communicated. So I frankly have asked Sue Weatherby to rearrange her schedule to do that and be our chief communicator. She simply can't do anything more than what she is now doing. Uh, and that became the reason why I said, all right, we must take some of those scheduling things that she's now doing out of her purview and create this position, which we had frankly already committed ourselves to. Uh, we have gone over the budget. We have looked at various pieces that are available to us, and the piece I put in there tells you how we see that uh, as possible. We have regarded this as an hourly employee. Um, however, it is a salaried position. However, looking at the hourly rates that we have to guide it, it's, in other words, not a, not a professional position for requiring certification or contract. Um, and it is a uh, position as both the announcement and the job description, I think, point out regarded as year-round. Um, 
and uh, similar to our head custodial position, which is very much in the same category. Be happy to answer questions. I hope that you will see fit to approve this position. We'd normally not bring in something like this after a budget is closed, but I regard this as a uh, very important way for us to manage uh, the complications we're facing. Is this a, can I ask a question? <laughs> Is this a forever position or one that's just getting through the building? Well, first of all, it's a, uh, all of the, a position that's in this category uh, is certainly year to year. I mean, it's any time budgets are reviewed, you review the numbers of positions you have. So I don't regard anything as carved in concrete. To answer your question whether it's directly tied only to the building project or not, we don't see it that way. We think that this is going to solve a number of communication problems in the way in which we run the buildings. We may find, of course, that we wish to modify it, change it in some way, or in fact um, connect it to something else, but we don't see it as disappearing. But we will certainly assess it. Charlie? This amount that's budgeted would include benefits, not in addition. This would not be a salaried amount and then additional benefits. No, um, we're very clear in the hiring position. It's a $20,000 $20, a year position. And um, the whole package available to these uh, budget lines is 25 so that would include benefits. The only reason I ask that question is that we've been caught before of approving a new position, and we don't always take into consideration there are, there's more to that cost than just the salary. Right. And, okay. Uh, one other question, in uh, looking at his or her uh, responsibilities, the community services would still hold on to the scheduling of the buildings? Uh, they are responsible for it now, and it will be run under the same way in which they're doing it. Uh, so it's, in, a, in essence, yes, the community services will be doing it. If this person is the one who actually physically does it, um, it will simply be working in concert. I mean, we work back and forth now over a variety. I mean, of we won't, we wouldn't have two people. Oh no, 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 no. You know, and that I could see. No. Questions of overbooking. I mean, I know it's done by computer, but still, when you get more than a couple hands on the pot. Right. No, but this is um, this is certainly going to be incorporated into the kinds of things that we're already doing. Carl. Um, it's basically, um, if I'm reading this right, it looks like most of what Sue does now is the new position. Well, it's, it's only pieces of what <laughs> she does, I have to admit. Right. Um, <laughs> well, is Sue going to be involved in community services at all anymore? Or is oh, yes. She gonna... Oh, yes. Okay. No, she, her major job, I mean, um, it, this, this is a kind of an ongoing discussion. How do you have one person who kind of deals with more than one uh, spot. I think, frankly, it is one of the best examples of one town concept I can think of. Uh, community services is, in fact, a uh, it, under the umbrella of the school department, uh, housed in our schools, and the uh, whole issue of responsibility of scheduling the buildings um, is uh, not just a community issue, it's also to make sure that we do, in fact, have uh, within the school community a sense of you know, what space is available and what have you. Um, Sue, so do you want to try to answer that, or would you, are you satisfied with how I explained that? <laughs> we will continue to um, schedule the buildings. This person may take on the responsibility of actually um, distributing that um, on a week-to-week -week basis, but the calls would still come to our office. They would utilize um, the program that we have in place at this point. So, um, and they will be more or less reporting to and working with the community services office, the transportation supervisor, the, cust the custodial supervisor, and the maintenance director. So, um, what this does is, is sort of just bring everything together so that this one person is sort of overseeing everything connected with utilization of the building. But still, there will be a great deal of communication with us. So it's, we're improving the process. We're really not changing it. 
Carol. I, I think what might be enlightening to the new board members is that what Sue took on for us three years ago was additional responsibilities over and beyond what she was doing. And in order for her to do that, she had to uh, actually increase some of the responsibilities of her own staff to take on some of her, some of her some functions, but not all of them. So she has taken on additional responsibilities besides her job and has done a commendable job. So, so I'd like to ask you a question. Are sure. you still going to be serving on the, on the bus um, route appeal committee? <laughs> <laughs> because yes. I would hate to, to quit taking those rides. That's not going to change. This person will be um, <laughs> provide us support and clerical services and so forth. But I wouldn't ask this person to be a representative on that committee. However, we did ask the question, since you're on the front line of the phone calls, how will you handle it? Mm. And, and um, are you OK about taking those calls initially? Certainly, we wouldn't put them in that position to make the decision. Um, that would move on up and would still go to the appeals committee. Right. OK. OK. Any other Help. questions of Sue? Any other discussion or questions? Bonnie? Well, I assume we have to vote on that. Yes, you do. Right? I understand the motion. Beth? Yeah. I move that we um, accept the uh, creation of a system wide support services scheduler position. Second? I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? 7 0. Thank you. I mean, this, uh, as I said, I don't, I really, my sense of process would be that we don't add positions once the budget is closed, but we are um, facing so much complication that we really appreciate this. The other issue that I would like to point out is that most of the major school building projects that I'm aware of, even ones that are new buildings being built somewhere where they're not impacting daily classes, uh, districts do everything they can to release a full-time administrator to do nothing but deal with that project in a communication basis. We've never had that kind of budget. We don't have it in our operating budget, and because it's all locally funded, we certainly did not feel free to divert any of those funds for that purpose. So we are putting together the resources we have in order to do the job, and um, I have every confidence that this will work. But Thank you. I, I would just like to request at some point, um, Rosemary Reed made the suggestion that we keep some kind of list of all these kinds of expenses that we are absorbing through our budget um, that are related to the building. And if this could be, or whatever components mm -hmm. of this deal are directly attributed to the budget, mm -hmm. to the building, we should do that. We have that list in. It's um, basically the kind of detail expenses. Great. Okay. I also had a suggestion for Sue. Maybe you should just get one of those big signs they have on the turnpike, you know, about expect delays and things like that. And you could just post the blasting messages that way. Huh? <laughs> Be effective. <laughs> All right. The next item is school board committee assignments. And I'm going to read through the list here. This is what we went through um, last night at our organizational meeting. So these are the school board committee appointments for the 1994-95 school year. Our standing um, committees are the finance subcommittee, and Charlie Greer, as you already know, is the chair. Priscilla Armstrong and Keith Witherell will also serve on that committee. Uh, the policy subcommittee, um, Beth Courier is the chair, and Carla Bernstein and Gail Dransfield will serve on that committee. On our more um, well, our ad hoc committees and various little things we have to do with teacher contracts and, and uh, uh, the school board association and such. We have a, a list here. For the athletic fee committee, Beth Courier, building committee, um, myself and Charlie Greer, um, calendar committee, which is a new committee which I requested to be formed to start looking at um, the way our calendar is structured, not for next year, obviously. We've had more than enough changes for next year. But just the idea of maybe combining February and April vacation, that kind of thing, things that have been raised to me by people in the community, community and, and other calendar-related issues that we should explore. Um, 
And did I already say who's on that no. committee? No. <laughs> Beth Courier will chair that committee and Carla Bernstein will serve on that committee. Co-curricular fee committee, Beth Courier. Community coalition, Carla Bernstein. Legislative liaison contact person, Gail Dransfield. Maine School Board Associate, Association Delegate, Charles Greer. Um, the school board members who will serve on the negotiating teams with our far, five bargaining units will be appointed as we get closer to, to the time um, to start those negotiations. PRVTC General Advisory Board, Priscilla Armstrong, Quality Council, Beth Courier, and that should say Ann Chapman on it, oh. too, actually, also, I just noticed. What, what does that mean? Um, I should also be under Quality Council with, with Beth. <clears throat> and Technology Committee, Keith Witherell and Char Charlie Greer will serve as the alternate for that committee. So those are our assignments. There will be other things coming up. Over the course Did of you the read year. the calendar committee correctly? No. Yeah. Oh, actually, I should say I crossed it out on mine. What I said was correct. Okay. Okay. Can you repeat um, that, please? Said, Beth Courier is the chair, and Carla Bernstein is serving okay. serving on it. No, okay. The other two were not. It's, it's were my, not correct. It's my error. I, yeah. I no. gave it was that yeah. list earlier. It was a little confused <laughs> last night. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, okay, and would you like me to just read off the sure. schedule, yeah. summer schedule? Yeah. Uh, we will be typing this up, but this didn't get done today, um, mainly because I hadn't written it down until about 5.30, so it'll get typed tomorrow and get out to you. But just for public notice, uh, we discussed the following dates for a summer schedule. Uh, number one, there will be a building committee meeting on June 30th, the evening at 7 o'clock, the evening of the day in which we open bids. Uh, and after some discussion, we thought it would be uh, the most efficient way we could think of was to have board members attend the school building committee. And when that finishes, when that building com um, meeting is over with, uh, we will have posted a special meeting of the school board. We'll then go into a session where a vote is taken to award the contract. Now, the reason we have to do that, part of our original agreement with the town council was uh, a list of duties of the school building committee. And one of them that will be important for that particular point uh, in time is that the school building committee reviews the bids, advises the school board. The school board, in turn, is a body that votes on awarding that contract. Uh, it is my understanding that the architects would like us to take that vote as quickly as possible. Obviously, if the bids are open, there are any questions, concerns, time is needed to review, we'll have to revise that schedule. But at any rate, this allows us to have a plan so we can go forward. Um, and we discussed that again last night. Additional summer schedule considerations. All school board members are asked to submit your draft goals to the superintendent's office by July 1st. We had a long discussion about uh, regarding those as ideas at this point, but we will try to um, consolidate them, work on them during the summer, <coughs> adopting them again in the fall. On July 12th, there will, from 1 to 5 in the afternoon, there will be a school board orientation workshop. Um, and by the way, the notice you get will give you places where these meetings take place. Um, one of our problems today was that we didn't have time to check the, th the three places that are available to us, downstairs the cafeteria in the, the town hall cafeteria, uh, the superintendent's conference room upstairs, and 1226. Frankly, if the weather is hot, that conference room is almost unbearable. So we will make every effort to find a more comfortable spot for these meetings, but we need to check with other people. Um, on July 19th in the morning, Ann Chapman and Beth Curry will meet with the superintendent to review what we have been doing with our policy manual, bring it up to date. On July 25th at 9.30, uh, the policy subcommittee will have a meeting. On August 16th from 8.30 to 12, the school board and the administrators will share a workshop. That's a date the administrators had already had scheduled. And on August uh, 23rd, um, it's my understanding, I just want to double check, that people were having difficulty with the second Tuesday in August as a regularly scheduled meeting and you preferred to have it August 23rd, is that correct? 
Okay, good. Then we will get that typed up with places and times out to you and post it as necessary. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the next item is personnel requests. Okay, the first uh, items on your in your packet, we had two letters of resignation, which I did include. One from Claire Rufenberg, a teacher who was on leave this year, been with the district for a few years. Uh, and Joanne Dowd, who had been given a, um, a leave of absence. Uh, both of them have sent in letters of resignation. Okay, Beth? I move that we accept the resignation of Joanne Dowd and Claire Rufenberg. Second. Second. Gail? Any discussion? Charlie? One of these resignations I'm having a very hard time with. I know that we have to accept it because she's going to leave, but it's the Joanne Dowd one. Uh, there was a lot of discussion last year when we allowed her to take leave of absence after only being a probationary teacher one year. I think the consensus was that she would bring back to us much more than, than what, what we would gain if she didn't go, and she's not coming back to us. So I find it, it's the first time on the board in five years that I've had a real hard time with the amount of discussion that went into something and feeling a little let down by that person. I see it's a positive gain for the person and probably, you know, if I was in the same situation, I probably would want to better myself, but I think I would also have a sense of obligation, at least to give one year to the system. So I'm going to abstain from this vote because I real, really feel a message has to go out that, you know, when the board goes out on a limb and makes an exception uh, that, you know, that it has to be reciprocal. Well, I agree with you, Charlie, actually, because I remember that discussion very well. And, um, and uh, I agree with you that, you know, under the circumstances, um, it's unfortunate um, that she's... That would she's you like to change, me to change the motion and do them separately then? I really would. I would, would withdraw please. my motion and I would like to make a new one. Mm -hmm. I move that uh, we accept the resignation of Joanne Dowd. Is there a second? Gail, any discussion? All in favor? Okay, five, ten, yeah. all opposed? Two. No, I, I did oppose. Okay, I'd entertain another I motion. Move that we accept the resignation of Claire Ruthenberg. Second. Second. Gail, any discussion? Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to object. I just, I've, I've known Claire over the years that she's been in our system and seen her in many positions. And in fact, she was one of the people that I, on my first board meeting in June, one of the issues that uh, was a hot issue was our, our gifted and talented program and we were going to an inclusion kind of program and Claire was going to be the designated person to take on that, that ominous task and it was an ominous task. And she was also involved in the gifted and talented aspects of our program at that time. My daughter had her when she was an art teacher and had a, a very positive experience. I know that, she, you know, that her, her teaching experience has also been a positive aspect for numbers of students and stuff. And then I see that she's looking for something that's a better match, and she's found that, and I'm very happy for her. Carla, um, Yeah, I just had a, a question, kind of, um, not knowing any of the details here. Since um, the letter does allude to um, misgivings and concerns, I wondered if she at any time had an ongoing dialogue with um, administrators or superintendents about mm -hmm. What these misgivings were? Yes, I've talked to her. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. Um, this is new teaching. Oh yeah, new assignments. teaching assignments. Um, and I would want to clarify. I think you just received a sheet, which I can't seem to put my hand on right on. Thank you. The first, the nominations that I have, um, the first name is one that we are looking at as a possible 
candidate for, depending on what happens with the music. So I will not be reading that name and just discount that. It may be something we get to later, but it was in our on my list of um, considerations, but we haven't gotten to that yet. So the, res the uh, nominations are um, Spanish teacher for the middle school full time at the BA1 level, Claudine Bravo. Uh, English teacher high school full time at the MA2 level, Amy Russell. And the third position is a teacher we have uh, had on staff, Betsy Nilsson. But as uh, my memo on this uh, issue also, or I guess it was in the blue notes, I discussed how we have finally decided to shape this position as computer instructor and computer lab coordinator, but as a full-time teaching position. We have taken that route after consulting with John Lunt, the coordinator that we are um, uh, hiring to help us make sure that the directions we're taking at, that high, at the high school lab are consistent with our long-range vision. I've also had an opportunity to talk to, to Betsy, talk to people with whom she's working. I'm really very impressed with some of the steps she's taken this year. I think this is going to work out well for us. Um, it is, a, even though she's been on contract with us, she was on a business education contract. You may recall she was a half-time teacher because that was what the business education um, uh, position was for the last few years, and we had also extended her um, appointment to be to include um, a half-time lab technician. So this is basically a uh, you could say it's extending the teaching part of her position, but it is an appointment to a full-time position uh, as um, a computer instructor. Do you want to say something, Charlie? No, wait for the nomination. Well, I'd entertain a... I move that we, we accept the superintendent's recommendations for uh, a Spanish teacher, Claudine Bravo, English teacher, Amy Russell, and a full-time teaching position for computer instructor, computer lab coordinator, Betsy Nielsen. Is there a second? Beth? Any discussion? Uh, just, just a comment on the, the direction that the, the high school computer program is going and... and um, there were, I think, about three different offerings this year for um, computer processing, computer-type courses. I think this is a first step in a reorganizing of, of what we want for expectations for children when they leave the system. As we all know in our own private and personal and business lives that the computer is a vast tool that we use every day and we aren't preparing our students for those uses, both as a research and as a tool for accomplishing tasks. And I think this is a major step. Any other comments? I just have a question in terms of the um, developing the mini courses for faculty and staff. Is that going to be system-wide? And that's not clear from here. It certainly will be working with uh, teachers at the middle school of Pine Cove who are already involved with that. Um, and clearly that is our intention. I mean, I couldn't tell you exactly what they will be at the moment, and I think her concentration next year will be at the high school. Okay, but there's a there's sure. possibility of oh, that sure. part of our problem is obviously fragmentation right. of efforts. Right. So. Uh, we, we do, we, we're, they are, in fact, talking back and forth okay. quite a bit. Okay. Carl? I just note that the... Um, Spanish teacher seems to have a greater background in French. And I was curious, as, um, there was some teaching in the Wells and the Gunquit systems. Was that French or Spanish? Uh, yeah. You have it. Yeah, I have it right here. Do you happen to remember, Nancy? Actually, one of the benefits of Claudine is that she is certified in both French and Spanish. She happens to be a native of France. Uh, when we did the interview with her, uh, we talked specifically about next year was a heavy Spanish year for us. We have Spanish commitments in grades four, six, and eight. The following year, we'll be in the same situation with French. And with Claudine coming on board, she gives us the option of being able to move between the two languages. She was part of the interview, does involve talking in the target language. I have learned to listen very attentively there. Um, I can tell you they always ask about travel in the foreign country, and any time they have to use an American word, I really can cue in on that part of the conversation. Um, but 
uh, Claudine did very well in both languages. She does speak Spanish. She does have a slight French accent with it, as one would expect, as we have English accents. But we also feel that that's a benefit for our students. And she passed both parts of that um, part of the interview very, very well. All in favor? 7-0. Thank you. And okay. request for consideration of half-time leave. OK. And I think we did include in your packet, yes, we did, um, a request for Rebecca Wing. And I gave a little bit of uh, background in your blue notes on this one. Um, Rebecca was hired as a part-time teacher. Uh, as she says in her letter to you, partly because she was attracted, partly because of the part-time nature. She has other things that she is involved with uh, in the composing and performing uh, of music. This past year, what with increased enrollment and various other uh, considerations, uh, the budget called for an increase from half to full-time, and Rebecca did agree to do that. This request is, frankly, after trying that for a year and feeling that that is not consistent with her um, basic needs and asking us to do um, a, to consider a, a job share. Knowing how difficult job shares can be, I've also discussed with Nancy um, and did make note in the blue notes that uh, you really have two possibilities here. You can discuss a job share. She has, in fact, the, um, we, we just simply listed as a suitable um, possible candidate, so you have some sense that there is somebody who is interested in this. That was not intended to be an appointment at this point. Uh, because I feel that the problem with job shares, first of all, they are a year-to-year -year decision. They have to come back to the board. Uh, if Rebecca is telling us that she really doesn't want to work or consider at any point working full-time, um, then it might be simpler for her to resign her full-time position, be reappointed to a half-time position, and the board uh, appoint somebody else as a half-time uh, person. We don't have all the, we can't do all of those things tonight. What the decision I would be asking you to make is whether you want to consider a job share or whether you want to ask Rebecca to um, consider, and I understand from my conversation with Nancy, she's, we, she's willing to technically resign but be reappointed. And we have to do it that way because of contract issues. Um, and then go ahead and interview for uh, another halftime position. And we would, at our next board meeting, would be clarifying that process. So I would entertain some discussion from you. Beth? Um, I guess I would lean towards having her resign her position and um, be reassigned as a half part-time position, and then we would hire someone else part-time. I think it will be cleaner, um, and it will allow flexibility in the long run. Charlie. I think just to enlighten the new school board members, what happens when you allow a full-time teacher to go to, go to a half-time, half-leave, is they have the option of coming back as a full-time teacher. And, and that can cause complications, as we found out this year with the kindergarten situation. A half-time, a half-time, half-time leave decided to come back as a full-time teacher. That teacher had a lot of seniority, and it involved some more bumping situations than, than what were ideal situations for that particular staffing. I think this is a cleaner way of, of avoiding those kind of issues. And we've dealt with those issues, particularly with the kindergarten. We seem to have had a lot of job sharing. Full-time teachers that have gone half-time teacher, half-time leave. And we've approved that on a yearly basis. I think what happens is what happened this year. When one of them decides to come back full-time, what happens to a someone who is half time. And I think it's cleaner and it makes it a better situation in the long run to deal. Carl? So just to clarify for me, the job share situation would make it like a half time leave mm -hmm. rather than an right. official. Right. Okay. I was trying to think of a way to to explain it after we were talking about it last night and Finally would gone would that be the same for the other half of this job? She would just be a, a half-time teacher, hired as a half-time teacher. Without any leave. Okay. 
the issue is that once you put somebody in a full-time contract, there is question as to whether they have rights to full-time employment. And the only way that attorneys advise us to handle that is for boards to review that on a year-to-year -year basis. So you can have somebody that you might go for four or five years conceivably doing that, and then they may wish to exercise that right to full-time. Uh, it would be one thing had Rebecca taken a full-time position, that's what she wanted, and there'd been some reduction in force or what have you. She came onto the halftime. That's really what her letter tells us, what she wanted to do. And she's tried the full time once and feels that that's interfering with what her initial plans were. Therefore, she's requesting what she's calling a job share. We're trying to frame this in the best interest of both the teacher and the system. I guess I don't understand why she has to resign and then be rehired if she was originally half time. Why can't she just go back to that and we open up the second part, well, second half of the job? I could. Contracts. Oh. It, has, it has to do with contracts and the fact that. Um, it has to do with seniority, too. Yeah, there, there are a variety of reasons that um, it can all happen in one fell swoop. It doesn't have to be a resignation with a period of time in between. It can just happen at one board meeting. So it's a formality? It is a formality. But it, it makes it cleaner, and I can tell you from our own experience of the last three to four years of dealing with these half-time, half-leave, granting half-time half leaves every year, what happened, happened this year, someone decided to come back full-time. In the end, they decided to ask for a leave of absence, which we approved at our last board meeting. So we avoided a, a situation in staffing due to a, because we did cut a position and transferred that position to another grade level. And it was causing an impact in who was going to move. And was it the most advisable or uh, best situation? Now, so you don't need a vote on asking her to resign so we can reappoint her? No, I just think. just direct you to. You, I think this, if, if there is consensus on the board and what I'm hearing, um, of course, with three new members who may not have understood or gone through any of these contract discussions before, this may be totally confusing. Uh, we're not really trying to be bureaucratic or, un or unsympathetic, um, but the, um, this kind of issue, uh, when you're looking for some light reading, sit down and read the teacher contract and you will see that there are pages about reduction in force, uh, requests for various kinds of leaves, and it is important to dot I's and cross T's so that we do not um, get ourselves into a situation where people have different ideas about what was actually said or expected. And that's why I am trying to be clear about this. And we One other question. Does this affect her seniority in any way, the, the changing of the? I would not see it as doing that. We could make that, uh, for instance, uh, when we finally make this decision, I can write a letter that accompanies it that makes it clear that the board does not see that as interrupting her seniority. We have granted her a leave of absence, so she's been with us too. That's true, we have. Right. Okay, I'll be guided by your. Directed. By, I think I hear consensus, and Nancy and I will discuss this, and we'll go forward and be back at a later time with. Could we possibly do this in conjunction with our June 30th? I think meeting? so. Any any so staffing probably. that we have at that point, we will certainly try to add to that. So. We don't have to delay issuing contracts. Um, one final piece for us. I do see our picture. Like oh, I see our senior. Would you like our, to come forward? <laughs> <laughs> Some of you may not recognize me. <laughs> I have a hard time recognizing you without your hat. <laughs> the hat was wonderful in the play. Thanks. It's been about seven or eight months before I've been here before you. But um, I thought since this is the last school board meeting that I'll be rep for, I ought to at least show up. <laughs> um, we're, we're in the process of wrapping up the school year now. We have three more days left to exams, and we can all sort of feel the push towards summer. But a lot has happened in the last few weeks. We did have the, our major success of a school musical, The Boyfriend. <laughs> um, which some of you may have seen, and that's, that was and will be the last musical with Gil Donatelli, who, as you all know, is leaving. Um, and we've also had our tennis team won the states, 
And we just had the state track me. I'm not sure how that went. But I, I'm sure it went well. Sports <laughs> teams are really good. Um, uh, we've had SAC elections for the next year. So <laughs> I'm glad to say there will be two school board reps <laughs> next year. So that if one of them <laughs> is mysteriously absent, the other one <laughs> will be able to come and uh, present before you. They'll be Jen Connell and Pat Cotter. Um, so you'll be seeing them in the fall. We also, on Saturday, we just had graduation. That went very well. And I think I've heard from a number of seniors who especially liked the project graduation afterwards. They, they had, I think, two stand-up comedians and a hypnotist who came in. And a lot of fun things went on. Um, that's about it. So if there are any questions, Mr. Greer. You also should be commended on your spring concert. Oh which actually was after the, uh, the musical, and mm -hmm. it was very nice. It was very nice in the gym, but the seats are atrocious. Yeah, the, the gym For an hour and 45 minutes. It's has a lot of nicer acoustics. Acoustics was better. But in the auditorium, it's a lot more resonant. I actually have a question. I don't, I don't know. You might not even know the answer to this. Rick might. Um, do you know anything about the senior retreat or how that went? I know that was rescheduled a number of times, and I know there were some grumblings some among some seniors. I think seniors that it ended up going very well. I know that just about all the senior class and a lot of the faculty ended up being pushed into the Saco River. Was that? Oh, that was it. <laughs> 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 but I'll join Matt up here as the representative. The, um, what you're referring to was we did have the senior retreat day. Um, at Camp Ketcher, and the weather was not great, but we went with it anyway, and I think for the first time through it, it went very well, talking with their director at the camp, who was trying it for the first time, and from uh, the seniors. Uh, I think the, had the weather been better, it would have been more, uh, more enjoyable for the kids, but I think for the first time it went well. And just for your information, uh, at Project Graduation, we had 89 out of the 101 graduates attend, which is one of our highest percentages uh, over the last three or four years, and it was a tremendous success. We had a great time. As Matt mentioned, we did have a magician and comedians, and it was a great evening, and uh, the kids really had a great time together. But I just wanted you to know the number of kids who take advantage of Project Graduation remains very high, and I think if you look statewide, our percentages are probably higher than, than many of the high schools, and especially in the greater Portland area that attend. So we're real pleased with the, uh, with the turnout there. We had a great time. Um, Thank Rick, you. Rick, Rick, Rick. Rick. <laughs> um, I don't remember the um, final date for that Camp Catcher thing, but were the students who were involved in the senior service projects, the volunteer service, able to attend? The yes, they were. They were given permission that day to, to, to either. Um, I must tell you that two opted to go to work, um, you know, at the senior projects, but we did, yeah, they were, they were allowed to take that time to, to attend. Okay. David Peary and I had worked that out so that uh, the, the, they would not be uh, penalized for for being in senior service. So they did have that option. So. How many students participated in the senior project? We had 18, I believe. This year. Was it 18? Or? I believe it was 18 this year. So that's an increase. From last year by three. I believe yeah. we had 15 last year. Yeah. And that's something we, again, need to review to see I think, uh, whether we continue this next year. Do we need to increase the numbers? Uh, also, the timing of, of the of the senior projects. Really, it, it delves into some of the, la the end of the year uh, things that, that are going on for seniors. And I think that tended to have two or three of them decide not to go with it because of you know, uh, the po potential for a class day and, and other activities that were going on, even though they were, we did arrange for them to, to, to participate in that. So I think we have to revisit that for next year also. I assume we'll get a report in the fall. Yes. About yeah. That. Oh, yeah. David will report again on that. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make you work your last uh, meeting. <clears throat> OK. Thank comments? you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Sorry you had to sit through that personnel stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get for being late. <laughs> now, the one final issue, the um, nominations <clears throat> for athletic coaching positions for fall 94-95. We have. Um, Boys JV Soccer, Ben Raymond. Girls JV Soccer, Peter Braun. Winter Coaching Position, Boys Varsity Basketball, Jim Ray. And Athletic Positions for the entire 94-95 school year, Assistant Athletic Director, Andy Strout. 
and House Manager Sam Boothby. Charlie. I move that we accept the superintendent's nominations for athletic positions for the school year 94 95. A second? Beth? Any discussion? All in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Well, it's 9 o'clock, and I don't want the new board members to think this is going to be the way it is all the time. <laughs> <laughs> because it won't, but this is a nice, nice way to start you out. <laughs> nice, nice quick meeting. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So second. All in favor? 7 0. Thank you.